How's it going, everybody? Burnout Alvarez and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio, March 12, 2024. Figure 4, online.com, slash wrestlingobserver.com. We've got a lot of news to get into here today. It's been a busy weekend. And today, we learned the four WWE corporate officers that were mentioned in the Janelle Grant lawsuit. Corporate officer number one is Nick Khan. Corporate officer number two, Brad Blum. Bloom. Blum, he's the COO of the company. COO. Corporate officer number three is Stephanie McMahon. And corporate officer number four is the former head of the WWE legal department, Brian Nurse. These names have all been confirmed. Yeah, they were confirmed by Ann Callis after research by Tim Marchman and um, Brandon Thurston and John Pollock. And there was a story in front office sports on it. And, you know, I mean, it's not, it basically tells you stuff that you probably already knew, which is there's no proof of the awareness. And in fact, they've denied, WWE has denied any awareness of any of the details of the things that were in the suit. But obviously there is awareness of Janelle Grant working for the company and the fact that she was working for the company in a role essentially as, you know, whatever, you know, Vince McMahon brought her in and people knew about the fact they were having a relationship or whatever you want to call what they were having. The fact or the situation, the allegation that the stuff with John Laurinaitis and some of the more depraved stuff, there's not any indication, um, that they knew that, but they knew of the fact that she was working for the company and her job essentially was, uh, in her legal department, was not to work. And so, you know, whatever that is worth, you know, that knowledge was there. And um, what that means, I don't know. Um, I don't know what, what's gonna, what the fallout is going to be on this. I mean, I think it's very clear that uh, TKO, you know, Ari Emanuel, Mark Shapiro, these guys. I mean, they're basically looking at the idea that Vince is gone and it's over. And obviously the the thing with Brock Lesnar being put on the roster page again would seem to indicate that they are basically waiting until their belief is it blows over before bringing Lesnar back. That's at least how I would read what is said. Nobody's actually making any comments when it comes to Brock Lesnar, other than the fact the name surfaced and probably looking at like what we put it up there, what kind of response does it get and all that. So, um, you know, as far as, you know, I, I don't, I don't anticipate anything immediately. Um, but you know, I mean, here, here's the thing when the, when the story first broke in 2022 about Vince, um, paying somebody off, um, over in a you know an alleged affair and everything like that, the original NDA story um, of the person who was whose friend contacted the board the um the board of directors. It was well known by many people in the company that it was Janelle Grant. I mean, the name was not a secret within the company, and and many reporters knew it. They didn't print it, but they knew it. So that not the, the idea that that. Nick Khan know you know knew or Stephanie McMahon knows. It's not a surprise. I mean, it's if you know what Nick Khan knows, um, it'd be hard to believe he wouldn't know some of this. Now, as far as the the dirt and the details and everything like that, I don't know if anyone knew that um, until the lawsuit came out. But um, so that's the the basic update on everything. Do you know why, when this first came out, they didn't name the four corporate officers? Why did they just refer to them as corporate officers? I don't know the answer, but she wanted to. And I, th- I think it's just her, lo- her her lawyer just felt it would be better to write the suit this, this way. But, <clears throat> excuse me, she was not, um, you know, she herself was, was not, you know, whatever, afraid to or whatever, you know, to name those names. But they decided not to. But once, but but Ann Callis did confirm them. You know when the store, when the reporters that wrote the story contacted her. So it's not, you know, it wasn't like it's this secret that we that she wanted to keep. But whatever it was, the reason, you know, when when she wrote the lawsuit, 
Um, she decided not to put those names in for whatever. Yeah. Well, I was very, very surprised when I saw Brock Lesnar's name return to the roster page. Yeah. I was not expecting that. I was not expecting that at all. I can't say I was either. Um, But, I mean, if you look at the history, when it comes to things like this, there's always a time frame, you know, and the mentality is always, you know, when does it blow over? And then you bring, you know, you slowly ease the person back in. Now, I did not expect this would be this quick. I will say that. I mean, usually it's like... You know, I mean, every case is different, but usually it's it's a long time. You know, whether it was Hogan or or anyone, you know what I mean. It it took a while, but then they made the attempt to to do that as they will. And always, you know, I mean, if Vince's thing wasn't so bad, I mean, I'm sure that, that there would be an attempt for Vince. But I just think that Vince and John Laurinaitis is just is just way too far to ever bring back. But but Lesnar, um, you know, I mean, he wasn't. Um, you know, his situation wasn't as, 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 de- you know, as deep as, as, um, Vince and, uh, Laurinaitis. So I'm not shocked that the attempt was made, I mean, which, you know, or, or would be made, but I figured it would probably be like, you know, nine months, a year or something like that. You know, much, much slower than this. Well, if you go to the front page of WrestlingObserver.com, uh, we do have a link to the entire 67-page lawsuit. Uh, if you have not read it, I don't necessarily recommend you do read it. Uh, it's certainly not easy reading. But you you can now, if you would like to, read it again and you can plug in all of the names and you know, mo- it's make mo- more it's- sense of everything. And I think that's actually, you know... I've noticed when when seeing people comment on this that um, it's almost like a game of telephone. Like, I don't think people have read it in in a couple of months now. And I've seen a lot of people saying a lot of things about what was said in there that actually weren't. And, you know, the, the Stephanie McMahon, you know, now that we know it's Stephanie McMahon, you know, you can go back and, and, and see, okay, well, what, what did happen with Stephanie McMahon? And... You know, her involvement in the lawsuit, there is very, very little. And, you know, what actually happened was they were together in a meeting, and, you know, Grant says that Stephanie, um, she got the impression, I forget the, I don't have the. Stephanie wanted a motion for her to sit down next to her. Sure, exactly. But also that she believed that uh, Stephanie mentioned, or that uh, Stephanie may have known. Other instances of her father engaging in inappropriate sexual conduct. Well, well, and I, 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 I would say that that's a very safe assumption. Well, it is. A, of course, it is. <laughs> I mean, know? I mean, like the, the the problem is that it's such a vague statement that it's like everybody knew that. You know, I mean, everybody knew that because Vince talked about it. He talked about Vince, it publicly. Vince talked about it publicly. You yeah, can yeah. go back to that. That uh, didn't he do like a Playboy interview in like nineteen. 19- you did a Playboy interview? It was 91 or some. It was long ago. Yeah. Well, and he and also, was talking about how he'd, he'd you know, it's look, just. Look, look St- Stephanie was at the trial in 1994. Yes. You know? I mean, in, in the trial, well, it was never, um, it was never outright stated at any point in the trial. Um, one of the witnesses, Emily Feinberg, I mean, it's like you couldn't not figure out based on the line of questioning between. Um, Laura Bravetti making, you know, making reference to the clothes that she wore at work where they didn't, they didn't go any further, but it's like, you know, like, uh, this isn't the kind of, like she was in the court, you know, on the stand and, and Laura Bravetti's looking at her with disdain and going like, are these the kind of clothes you wore at work? And then she actually said like, well, I actually have worn this dress at work, but, um, and then Linda is just sitting there like crying like crazy. Well, this is all going on and Stephanie's there, you know, so it's like um, and I mean, I'm not saying that this is where she learned it. I'm just saying that everyone in the courtroom pretty much had that one figured out. It was not a secret. And Stephanie's worked for the company for a long, long time. And she's she's anything but stupid. So, you know, and again, like Vince has said it. And, and I know that she's been upset that Vince publicly said it because it's sort of humiliating to her mother, you know, with well, the course. stuff Vince said. Yeah. 
So I think that at the end of the day, it's like we we do have some new information. We have we have these names, but ultimately we don't have the answers to the important questions, which it's are. Which is what did they really know? Yeah, what did they really know? Did they really not know anything? I mean, uh, I forget which corporate officer it was, but you know, in the in the suit, it's talked about how you know this this corporate officer was warm with others, but very cold with me. And you know what what does that mean? I mean, does that mean they knew all that was going on? Does that mean that they did not think this was appropriate? That Vince was having an affair with somebody? Well, well, but well, what well, could well. the person do about it? We well, don't know I mean, any of this right now. Yeah, well, well, wouldn't wouldn't you think that everyone with knowledge of what was going on would think it was inappropriate and also be in a position where there's nothing that they could do about it? Well, that would be- seemingly be. I mean, I mean, but we I, don't know. We don't know. They could have known more. We, but we yeah, don't yeah, yeah, know. Yeah, I know. I, I know. But we don't we, know. We, they could have. They could have known more. But as far as like the the basic part of what she was hired for, or what her job was, and you know, and what she was doing, whatever her work was, the people in her department, like especially in the legal department, where essentially her work was just kind of sitting there from nine to five and not doing any work while everybody else worked their ass off. It's like people in that department, they're going to figure out something right you know so and certainly like you know norse um or nurse you know he's gonna know but you know but as far as like the the level of it yeah we don't know and um you know i mean the the feeling always was or and certainly what everyone will claim is that you know until they actually read the lawsuit they had no idea of any of this past the surface stuff which you know they all knew and then the other the other thing that I I have to go back and read is is everything involving Brock Lesnar. Like I don't remember. Do we have text messages allegedly from Brock Lesnar? Yes. Okay. They're in the Vince McMahon chain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. where Brock is kind of um, saying that um, if I'm you know if I'm with her, I'm going to ruin her for you. So which isn't ex- exactly um, it is what it is. You know. I mean, um, I wouldn't be so quick to bring him back. Are you um, kidding? Text messages, you know what I mean? It's like it's like he's he's it's it's not a good look to say. I was least. far more shocked at the idea that he's coming back than that we actually got four names. Oh yeah, no, me too. Without doubt. Without doubt. I I mean, as far as the names go, I mean like you pretty much knew in in the case of um three of the four, I think. You kinda had them limited to like one or two names in each case. Like we knew that like um, I mean, because there's only a certain number of members of the board of directors. So when, you know, it's like this person's a board of directors, like two people in the board of directors. So we know that the board of directors people had to be Nick Kahn, Stephanie, or, or Paul Levesque. Those, those, were the, those were the choices. Or Frank Riddick, I guess, would be another one. But, you know, so, um, and the head of legal is, you know, who left the company. That wasn't that difficult. Um, so, I mean, there, there was very few options, you know, but, but to narrow it down to the actual person. Or p- persons, um, you know. I mean, that is the new thing, and um, you know, as far as anything else, I mean, you know, the, the justice system moves slowly, and uh, that's about it. Well, on a related but also unrelated note, uh, Maya Lesnar, Maya Lesnar, Brock's Lesner, daughter, Brock's daughter won the NCAA Indoor Shot Put Championship on Saturday night in Boston um, with a throw of. Um, I believe it was 60 feet, nine and uh, nine and a half inches, something like that, nine and three quarters. Um, and it was close. You know, she's she's a junior at Colorado State. She finished 11th last year and moved up to first this year. I mean, the big meet would be the outdoor championships, which would be in the spring. Um, but uh, the indoor is kind of like a preview of the outdoor. And so she's going to be considered... Um, you know, the number one female shot putter in the country right now. As far as in college, collegiate shot putter. Good I don't in- know if she would, I don't know if that would lead her to, you know, go for the Olympics or anything like that, but it, it certainly could. So we've got a number of uh, names for the Hall of Fame. We've got uh, Paul Heyman, Bull Nakano, U.S. Express, and now Muhammad Ali Yeah, has well, been announced for the WWE Hall of Fame. Yeah, um... I mean, you know, whatever. It's WWE Hall of Fame. There's not a lot you could say. I mean, Muhammad. I was I was surprised Muhammad Ali wasn't already in. So, there you go. I mean, he, 
You know, he did a few wrestling things. He was uh, obviously the Muhammad Ali Antonio Noki match in 1976. Um, Phil, Bill Watts brought him in uh, to be the manager of the Snowman against Jake Roberts for a Superdome show and for some interviews. And then um, this was actually after WrestleMania. Did of course the he was supposed to referee the main event at the first WrestleMania in 1985. But um, when he got there and they tried to explain everything, they realized that would be a disaster. So Pat Patterson ended up being the referee. And they had um, Ali stationed outside the ring as the outside the ring referee. And then, of course, for the finish, he was going to do the count. He ran into the count. And um, what else did he do? He was um, he, he, he went to, um, I think he was at one of um, the Inoki shows, maybe uh, the retirement show or one of the last shows, and also... Obviously went to uh, North Korea with the WCW crew and the, <laughs> crew and the New Japan crew, which, you know, for a lot of the WCW guys and New Japan guys, you know, as far as like the going to Korea was a nightmare, but hanging out with Ali was like a lifetime experience that they all, you know, brag about or whatever, you know, that, uh, you know, that uh, they got to hang with Ali and watch him do his magic tricks and, and all that, you know, because Ali was obviously, you know, one of the most famous people in the entire world um, in his in his day. And, uh, you know, Winderman Rotunda, I, I don't know that uh, Bray Wyatt's going to be in the Hall of Fame, but I could see that being fitting where, you know, his uh, father and his uncle, um, who he was named after because Bray Wyatt's real name is Wyndham Rotunda, um, you know, it would be sort of fitting. I mean, as far as, you know, the... You know, it's a different Hall of Fame because it's it's Paul Levesque's Hall of Fame. It's not Vince McMahon's Hall of Fame. So we're, we're kind of like looking at, like, is it going to be any more credible? It's hard to say. I mean, like, uh, Paul Heyman is a no-brainer. Uh, Nakano, as far as her WWE stint, is hardly Hall of Fame worthy. She was only there for, only there for a couple months, never on television, or I shouldn't say never, but like three or four times on TV the whole entire time. Just worked a bunch of house shows. Um, you know, good matches, not great, but good matches. But as far as for the totality of her career, is Bull Nakano a Hall of Famer? You know, I mean, yeah, she's one of the greatest women wrestlers of all time. So, yes, that's a fair pick. And then um, Ali, as far as celebrity, you know, I mean, celebrity Hall of Fame, whatever, that's fine. And Wyndham and Rotunda, I mean, as far as the tag team goes, you know, they had a run um, for a couple months. They were tag team champions in WWE, but you could probably go through and and find, I mean, with no exaggeration, 30 to 50 tag teams that aren't in that have better credentials than Wyndham and Rotunda. Um, you know, Barry Wyndham was a, a great wrestler um, in his heyday, which that period was part of that heyday, and he never really got that big singles run in WWE, but he did in Florida. had many, many great matches with Ric Flair, fantastic matches with Ric Flair, and uh, later with uh, Jim Crockett Promotions, um, and the Four Horsemen, which he's already in one hall, the, the Hall of Fame with the Four Horsemen. And Rotunda was, you know, I mean, he wrestled for years and years. Mike Rotunda, Michael Wall Street, VK Wall Street, um, IRS. Those were kind of his main names. Football player at Syracuse. And wrestler, Dick Byer was actually, who was a, Dick Byer was the one who got him into pro wrestling. And, um, you know, I mean, he was a solid, good wrestler. And, um, but I mean, like, you know, there's, you know, you could just list team after team after team that, you know, between longevity, I mean, even in just WWE alone, that would be, uh, you know, you would rank well above them. But again, you know, it's, it's the WWE Hall of Fame. And I just think, you know, is if it, if, if it has something to do with the synergy of Bray Wyatt going in, then why not? You know, and again, with the WWE Hall of Fame, you know, you don't you don't really look at real credentials. It's sort of like, why not? Everyone's okay. Johnny Rods is okay. Anyone's okay. I mean, as far as that goes, then they're okay. You know, they were tag team champions. Um, they were good wrestlers. Barry Windham was actually a, a fantastic wrestler at 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 uh, in the heyday of his career before his knees started giving him trouble and everything. We got two shows coming over the next couple of days. Tomorrow is NXT. Today is NXT actually. And we've got a North American title match, Obafemi versus Brooks Jensen. Sean Spears faces Ridge Holland. Gigi Dolan versus Ariana Grace, where if Ariana wins, 
She gets to give Gigi a makeover. And we have Thea Hale and a mystery partner against Kiana James and Izzy Dame. And then for Wednesday, we've got AW Big Business with Samoa Joe versus Wardlow for the AW title, Darby Allen versus Jay White, Young Bucks and Okada versus Eddie Kingston, Pac, and Penta. We got Hook and Jericho versus the Gates of Agony, Willow Nightingale versus Riho, and the expected debut of Mercedes Monet. Mm hmm. They've really done no hints nothing. other than two dollar signs on that advertisement. Yeah, nothing. Nothing at all. Um whatever. I mean I don't I I really don't understand it. It really it really makes no sense. I mean there it's like if you think it's not a surprise and everyone knows, then you might as well push the hell out of it, you know, promote it like crazy. And if you think it's a surprise, um, it's not to some people. You know, I mean, most people, many, many people know, but a lot of people don't. Uh, but anyway, I mean, I guess it doesn't matter if you could, you know, it's all about, you know, I mean, again, like whether the rating is big or indifferent or whatever, in the long run, whatever, whatever value she's going to have is not impacted negatively by the fact that the rating is what it is. And it's probably going to be good. Certainly better than last week. And, um, you know, they're going to have a larger than usual crowd. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's a little over 7,000 uh, as of right now. Maybe they'll get to 8. They're not going to get to 10. Um, whether they would if they promote the hell out of her in Boston. Uh, well, you know, we'll never know. We'll never know the answer. So there you go. Well, one person who's not going to be there is Anthony Henry who this weekend was uh, working a non-AW match. Yeah, and Ber he was wrestling in Berwyn, Illinois, on an independent show against Brian Keith, took a knee to the jaw, and got a broken jaw and needs surgery. Yep. So he was going to be, they were going to be in the tag team tournament. That's right, that's right. Which which, which I guess is going to be announced Wednesday, right? The teams? Bro, they better have brackets Wednesday because the thing starts this weekend. It starts. It starts on. Saturday. Although we did have one Tony Khan tournament that began before we had brackets. This has happened before. Oh yeah. But hopefully we get brackets before the tournament starts this coming and, and actual names weekend. Yes. I get. I guess the infantry is probably going to be in it though. I would think Cause so because they're giving them a. They 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 had they they did a video package for them on Friday and then they did a promo on Saturday. All right, we got some uh, some ratings to talk about, including a gigantic quarter for uh, SmackDown. 2.8 million viewers for the end of that uh, Rock and Roman versus Cody and Seth segment, which I thought was a great segment, by the way. Yeah. Man, this well, those Rock. Guys, God. Those, those guys. I thought Seth Rollins was tremendous, you know, and, and Rock is, you know, it's always dynamic. Um, yeah, 2 million 830,000 viewers and an 0.83 in the quarter in 18 to 49, over a million. 0.83 in 18 to 49. A million 90,000 viewers. I mean, the one thing here is, is is it showed that the smart way to do this, and it's just not, this isn't just Dwayne Johnson. This is probably like a, a good model for everyone, is that if you have something really big, the best thing is to put it on last because if you put it on first, like they did the week before, what happens is people see it, it gets a big quarter, and then... How did such people... an obvious thing become such an antiquated concept? I mean... It's been... It's save been... the best for last! You couldn't have an older... Yeah, but like... I mean, AEW often puts the, the main thing on first. Well, I don't get it. But I mean, um... I understand the idea, like, okay, well, we have a big lead-in, so start off with something hot to try to keep some of those viewers. Well, there's, but... different, there's, wait, 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 there's a difference. But, I mean, the... you've got to have, like, a big main event. You've got to have something that people are waiting for till the end of the show. Well, the Don't last... miss out on this. The last segment should be the biggest segment. Now, yes, if you're going to shoot a big angle and you want it in front of the most people, you probably, when it comes to dynamite, it's probably best to do it... Um, you know, in the first or second segment, but maybe even in the fifth. But um, for for WWE, it's best to do it in the fifth segment. Nine to nine fifteen is is the sweet time to do your biggest angle because you know a lot of their audience comes in late, and uh, that usually is the segment. Um, 
you know, some of it may be at this point um, self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that they've been doing the 9, 9 p.m. segment with, with the biggest thing on the show for so long that people kind of have it figured out. So it kind of like people will tune in at 9. Well, there's definitely some habit here because I always laugh when I look at the uh, NXT quarters and it's the like, NXT quarters are, are don't they're they're but they're, they're so often a nine o'clock quarter that's sky high and you look at what's on, well I mean for NXT standards but you look at what was in that segment and it's like interview segment interview segment commercial backstage segment it's like nothing happened but people are so used to tuning in at the top of the hour to see if there's like a big angle going down because it happens on Raw they used to do something big at the ten o'clock hour or the nine o'clock hour or the ten o'clock hour. People are just used to tuning in at the top of the hour to see what's going on. And NXT always gets a bump, and there's nothing on usually in that quarter. Yeah, well, it becomes self-fulfilling. But AEW, is, it's hit and miss. It, it, sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. You know, I mean, um, AEW's patterns, I mean, like, AEW's patterns change all the time. The first segment usually will, the first segment will usually have the most viewers because you have a lot of women viewers and a lot of older viewers from Big Bang Theory. Um, but it's not like the highest in 18 to 49. I mean, there are weeks that it is, but very often it's not because, um, the, um, you know, like, you know, they bring in a lot of new 18 to 49 viewers and, you know, that can get bigger and bigger depending on very often whatever the hot segment is to the people. And it could be in any quarter, you know, I mean, that's the thing with AEW. Um, I mean, usually the last segment is not that strong, but sometimes, it is, you know, I mean, if it's something really big. But as a general rule, um, they tail off at the end. As as a almost always rule for a Raw, it, it tails off in the last 30 minutes, 45 minutes. God um, damn, it's three hours ending at 11 o'clock. Yeah. I expect. However, you know, I mean, that's, that's in the old days, um, it used to, you know, every show used to peak in the last 15 minutes, whether it was at... You know, uh, well, in the real old days, it was only two hours. Yeah, but it's, even when it was nine to eleven, yeah, you know, it still could peak at ten forty-five. Um, you know, because you you always had the main event segment last, and then always had the big angle last. But um, and you you still do. I mean, you know, WWE still does the main event. You know, the main event match or main event segment is usually the last segment on 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 Raw most weeks. All right, the rest of these numbers. Well, yeah, so it was ended up being 2,439,000 viewers and 0.69. Very strong number. Of course, with Dwayne, you're going to get a very strong number. First, of course, on television that night by a wide margin in 18 to 49. Six out of eight network shows in uh, six place out of the eight network shows that night um, in to total viewers. I mean, it's still, you know, pales in comparison in the over 50 viewers, which is where the bulk of TV viewers are, um, compared to the Friday night stuff. And they don't even have hot shows on Friday night. So, um, but, um, you know, it's very, very strong in 18 to 49. And then uh, Rampage, 364,000 viewers, 0 0.13. I mean, it's it was well up from last week, up 21%. In eighteen to forty nine from last week, so I guess that's good. It was number fifteen um, for for the night on cable. It was in its time slot. It was fourth. It was behind the NBA on Patrol Live and Fox News. It beat everything else. Hundred and whatever it is, hundred and twenty seven stations or whatever that number is. So um, I mean, it's a good number. I mean, for 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 a Friday night at ten p.m. All right, we got this Raw show to talk about here. And, in fact, this week we actually got new matches for WrestleMania. As expected, it is going to be Sami Zayn and Gunther for mm -hmm. the Intercontinental title. Sami Zayn won the gauntlet match, and so he'll be facing Gunther for the title in a singles match. I thought Sami Zayn did a great job tonight. Yeah. Really great job as far as just everything, all the way, you know, wrestling-wise. And we're going to have a uh, five-team ladder match. Six-team. Six-team ladder match. Six-team ladder match. And, uh, well, five teams will be facing the Judgment Day in a ladder match. And they're having a... Uh, It'll be three teams on that will be finalized next Monday from Raw. And then, I don't know if it's this... Probably, probably two teams Friday on SmackDown. 
And the raw, let me just see the the raw matches um, are where do I have them? Um, it's um, New Day against. Uh, oh, you're talking about this coming and, Monday? This coming Monday. Okay, it's R Truth and Miz versus Zindu Share. Right. It is uh, DIY versus the Creeds, which where have they been? They dropped off Creeds, the face of Cre- the Creeds have been on uh, main event. And, and the New, New Day New- versus Alpha Academy, Otis and Akira Tozawa. Otis and Tozawa, right. So that's those are the three matches. So, so those three winners, which would probably be New Day. Um, I don't know who would win between the Creeds and Gargano and Ciampa. And be, being that it's a ladder, uh, they may go with Gargano and Ciampa, given it's a ladder match. And then Miz and R-Truth, almost for sure because Miz and R-Truth are feuding with Judgment Day. So those are probably, so now we probably, those are four of the six teams, and the other two are going to be um, announced, you know, or they're going to have matches on SmackDown, probably this coming Friday. All right, well, the show opened up with a uh, a long segment, as they often do. And uh, where's my notes here? Hold on one moment. I went the wrong way. All right, uh, the show. Where are my raw notes? I don't know. I can't tell you, but uh, it opened with Travis Scott coming to the building for whatever reason. There we go. Well, actually, Drew came out, and he uh, he was very angry, and he basically said, you know, Seth is a a hypocritical junkie. He said that uh, the big picture here is the Rock. This business started in the carnivals, then the smoky buildings, and now the sold-out well, arenas. And well, the next just... step is working with one of the most powerful men on earth, The Rock. You know, it's funny. Is like, uh, I don't know. It's all arena, story. all arenas were smoky. Yes. You know what I mean? Madison Square well, Garden we have, was smoky. We have worked our way out of them, in fact. Yeah, it's smoking loss. He said, but I mean, Rock... I, I, I mean, when I was a kid, they were smoky arenas. But this had nothing to do with the change in wrestling fans. It had everything to do with the fact that you're not allowed to smoke in arenas anymore. He said Rock was upset with Cody. That had nothing to do with Seth or himself. And Seth needed to just let it go. And Seth came out and gets in the ring and he goes, You know, I got you got my attention with that Claymore last week. So how about you get more of my attention? Why don't you hit me with another Claymore? And I was like, why are you let, why why are you allowing him to hit you with the claymore? And he gets on his knees, he puts his hands behind his back. He's like, "Come on, hit me with the claymore!" And like the crowd's all confused, and I'm all confused. Like, what are you doing, dude? And so Drew says, "Listen, I just want to talk to you. Just listen for once." He says, "A while ago, you told me get over the bloodline, get over it, and you were right. And I got over the bloodline. I got focused." And here I am going for a championship match at Mania. But now you need to take your own advice and just get over the bloodline. And so Seth does this promo, and he, he talks about how you remind me of CM Punk, who was the biggest hypocrite I ever met until I met you. You cried about the bloodline for years, but now look at this. You beat Cody, bloodline helped. You beat Jey Uso, bloodline helped. I think you want to be a member of the bloodline. And so Drew says, I know what you're trying to do. You want me to put you out of your misery, but I'm not going to. I'm going to leave, and there's nothing you can say to provoke me. And so he goes to leave, and Seth says, one more thing. You know, I've not paid any attention to you on the road to Mania, because of all the threats I have going into this show, the bloodline, Roman, Rock, my back, my bad knee, at the bottom of my list, the thing I'm worried about the least is Drew McIntyre. That builds up the match well. And Drew acts like he's going to leave, but then he turns and, and he just walks out. And I was like, what in the hell was this segment right here? Why is Seth begging to get Claymore with his hands behind his back? Why is Seth saying, well, I, I, mean, I don't thing, worry about you at all? The, the, the whole the whole thing the whole thing is, is like uh, he's trying to make Drew lose his cool um, to get the mind game advantage. So he beats his ass? He didn't beat his ass. He didn't do it. He didn't fall for the gig. I don't... I mean, in the end... Falling for the gig would have been Drew beating his ass. Yeah, well, maybe Drew gets hurt doing it. I don't know. Uh, But the thing, the thing, you know, well, I mean, the idea is is that he loses his cool, and and Drew's trying to not lose his cool. But the, um, you know, the thing is, is though, like, he, he did totally downgrade the match. Like, the tag match is like a big deal. 
and he downgraded his own match because he said it's the least important thing that he's yeah. that, that he's dealing with is his match on the second day of WrestleMania. He actually came off as a heel. And Drew came off as a babyface because everything he said was the truth. Like, how about you forget that shit and concentrate on our match? We got a big match here. So it's yeah. like, nah, it ain't much. I'm not worried about it. Yeah. Kick me while you're at it. I didn't like this segment all that much. Then we had uh, Chad Gable. Actually, everybody throughout the show did a, uh, a promo building up the gauntlet match. I thought they were all very well done. Made the match seem like a really big deal. They really did. You, you know, the, the a lot of the stuff that they've been doing, you know, um, between, you know, video packages and the sports feel and the entrances and things, you know, I mean, people, come, I, I think they've really made the show look, um, the show just looks a lot better. It really does. Uh, Lee Fitting was a, a great addition. And uh, Kevin Dunn, for all those years, I mean, it really is something that all those years people used to complain about Kevin Dunn and Vince McMahon. And when both are gone, it has improved so much. Yeah, it's almost like people were right. It's almost like people were right, yes. While during this entire time, everyone in the company would swear, you guys don't know what you're talking about. And it turns out that maybe we did. Yeah. Becky Lynch and Liv Morgan. This match was a match that was just kind of there for a while, but then they did this spot where they're brawling on the apron, and Liv gives her kind of a cartwheel into a sunset flip powerbomb off the apron hard onto the floor. That was dangerous. They showed a replay, and God, that landing looked like it sucked. Just weeks before Mania. I couldn't believe Becky took that. And the fans saw that, and they were into the match from that point forward. It and was still it was still kind of sloppy, though, in a lot of ways. Traded submissions, and Becky finally caught her. She was coming off the top, hit the manhandle slam for the pin. And, uh, yeah, it was good there at the end. And then Rhea comes out, and before she can give the ring, Liv in the aisle screams at her that you took everything from me. Someday I'm going to take everything from you. Which actually makes me wonder if she's going to cost Rhea the title at WrestleMania. Or maybe win Money in the Bank and, and get the title that way. Could do that as well, except I, I kind of figure Becky might win at Mania. Could be wrong, but... could I mean, it could, go either, it could go either way. I mean, I think that six months ago, the idea probably was for Becky to win, especially with her book coming out. But I don't know. I mean, Rhea's been so successful in this role that I could see them just going, hey, you know what? She's younger. She's going to be a superstar. And there's no... I mean, there is no need for her to lose. Well, the other I mean, thing, too, she, is if she you... She could lose, but there's, there's, it's not like... Like, months ago, I would say, you know, oh, God, you got to get that belt back on Becky because she's by far the biggest star. I can't say that anymore. Well, the other thing, too, is if you if you look at the Mania card, it's like... I very much... I mean, Cody's winning for sure. I mean, they basically has told to you win. on on SmackDown. Co- Co- they Cody they has basically to win. said if he doesn't win, he'll never get a shot at the title again. Yeah. And they didn't say against Roman. It was like the AW thing. You'll never get a shot at the title again. And then we've got, you know, I'm sure Sammy's probably beaten Gunther. And he should. He you, should. You can't have every babyface win every big match at Mania because you do have a post-Mania. Yeah. So I think there's going to be some people, some babyfaces have to lose. And so it could be Becky here. But uh, anyway, uh, they had a back and forth, and then Becky said, you know, when people believe in me, I'm good. When they doubt me, I'm great. And she vowed to uh, take the title. We had uh, Pearson Aldis making the big announcement of the six-pack ladder match, which got Judgment Day furious. They said they were going to go talk to those guys. And then, my God, we had the just bottom-of-the-barrel this next segment, it's Maxine and Ivy Nile against Indy and Candice. So the match starts. It goes like 30 seconds, and then Ivy makes the hot tag. 30 seconds into Maxine. So Maxine starts running wild, and Michael Cole on commentary is screaming that she proved she's proving she belongs. And she goes for a cartwheel into a reverse worm, and Candace just walks in the ring, and she stands in front of her. And Maxine turns around and just stops in her tracks. And this little, tiny, five-foot Candace just backs her into the corner and starts bullying Maxine, who, who like, I don't know how tall she actually is. She may be, like, five five eight maybe. But she looks, yeah. like, seven feet tall next to Candace. 
And Candace is looking straight up at her and yelling at her. And Maxine has to act like she's about to cry. And she, Candace she says... She was acting like she was crying. She says, she's not taking that. She goes, Maxine, you're stupid. And these people are booing you because you don't belong. And if you think the internet hates you, wait till you hear what the other women in the locker room say about you. And then she says, oh, you're going to cry? Well, it's a good thing your dead brother isn't here to see the embarrassment you've become. Oh, isn't that horrid? horrid? And Maxine goes, I'm not doing this. And she starts to walk out. But Indy gives her a boot. And she gets pinned. Candace goes, pin her. She covers her after a boot and pins her. And I was like, okay, first off, what are you talking about her brother's dead? Like, I, I had no idea what they were talking about. I know now. Yeah. Her brother had a, a genetic disease which left him partially paralyzed. He was prone to seizures. He couldn't drive, so he had to have people drive him. And he was in a lift, and the driver, I don't know if they took a wrong turn or what, but he had another car, and her brother was killed. He was 22. But, like, they've never told that story. We don't know anything about that story. I don't know why that actual legitimate death had to become part of this storyline here. And what they're it's doing kind of, it's is... Pretty, it's pretty damn tacky. Yeah, and they're, they're, well, they're making an angle based off what happened on the internet, on Twitter, which, like, the vast majority of the WWE audience has no idea what even happened that day. I think it, like, happened on a weekend. And, like, most of the audience isn't sitting there living and dying on the internet. I barely know what happened that day. I know, like, it was when somebody yelled, you suck at Al's show, and then everybody was up in arms about it. This whole thing is ridiculous. And it's like, now it's a storyline on TV, and they're bringing her actual, legitimate dead brother into the storyline? I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. So, yeah, this was this was bottom of the barrel, is what oh, yeah. this was. I mean, even if you didn't bring the brother in, and you just were watching it for what it was... It was still, like, really just bad shit, you know? It was like, when she's yelling at her and everything in the middle of a match, she's breaking down in the match, and just like, you know, what is, you know, just, and, and that finish, it was just bad. Plus, I mean, even the promo, she's like, she's not taking that. <laughs> like, she's not taking a move. What are you talking about? Like, it's fake? This was This was break the third wall shit. She's not taking that move. She's not taking a reverse worm. I'm like, what are you talking about? I did not like this segment at all. No, the match sucked, too, because of because everything about it sucked, basically. So Finn and Priest then walk into uh, Pierce and Aldis's office, and they're all angry, and they go, whose idea was this match? And both Pierce and Aldis are like, well, you know, we take a lot of, in there, Hemin and Han, and finally, Priest is like, whose idea was it? And so they, they reveal it was Miz and Truth's idea. And now Priest is furious. And he goes, I want to beat their asses tonight. And Pierce says, well, they're not here. They're doing media. And Truth immediately walks in. Because the gimmick is he's so dumb he doesn't know he has media. And so Priest says, well, I'm glad you're here, Pierce. Make the match. Well, I mean, the thing, so the thing is he comes in and Pierce looks at him and goes, what are you doing here? You have media. And he goes, I've got media on Monday. And then Pierce has to tell him that it's Monday. Yeah. But Raw's on Monday. Yeah. Well, his gimmick is he's an idiot. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. He's an idiot enough to find where Raw is, even though he didn't get a ticket to there? I don't know, man. Well, we had a great segment next. It was Michael Cole interviewing Cody. And yeah, this was, this was, was really good. This was quite great. And Cody's talking about, he's asked about the slap, and he says, you know, Rock was a wrestler before he was a Hollywood, and he knows what this is. It was a receipt. And he says, Cole says, why would you put that match in jeopardy for Sunday? And why Seth? You guys have had problems in the past. Seth wants to be the top guy. He was the last guy to beat Roman, albeit via DQ, he says. <laughs> Did he beat Roman via DQ since yeah, yeah, he was yeah, pinned yeah. by Jey Uso? No, 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 no. It was before the pin. But okay, it was not, so Jey was... Uso was the last guy to beat Roman. Well, but that was an tag, not in a single. Still. So, so Seth would be the last one to get his hand raised in a win, even though it was basically a match where, you know, he was like, it was basically he was choked out, but he was in the rope, so it was a DQ. I mean, he was, you know, but it was technically a win. So he's, I mean, they had been pushing Baron Corbin as the last person to beat him because Baron Corbin beat him with, you know, like years and years ago. But 
technically, that's the only DQ loss that Roman has had in a long, long time. Well, then Cody says, I want to answer a question. Or his answer with Seth is, you know, people change. That's his, that's his excuse. So then he says, uh, you know, last time we did an interview, you asked me if I was worried about failing again. And he says, I, I'll be honest, I'm nervous, I'm scared. But he said, this is no longer about Roman's title and myself. The story is about all the fans who have followed me to the end. He said, there's all these people I'm doing this for. Actually, he breaks down into tears when he says, my mother's the only one I've got left. I can't hand that belt to Dusty, but I sure as hell can hand it to my mother. The story is beyond me, but it's up to me. And he said, last year at Mania, Roman said we were in the third inning. Well, we're in the last inning now. And Cole, after Mania, you'll be able to say, a Rhodes is the WWE champion, and that I finished the story. Cody was so awesome in this segment. He was. He was unbelievable in this segment. Yeah, he was breaking down, talking about his mom, talking about his wife, meeting him when he was wearing a mask, and... You know, Michael Cole was the one who hired his wife. That's how they met. And, um, yeah, yeah, he was great. He was great. We had Becky and Liv having a meeting, and then they get attacked by, my God, Nia Jax's feud will never end. It is supposed to end next week. Becky and Nia, last woman standing next week. I hope it ends next week. Damage Control beat Zoe and Shayna for the women's tag team titles. So so they could do a deal next week where uh, Jade Cargill screws Nia to lead to Nia and Jade Cargill. Yeah. You know, if that's the direction they want to go. Yeah. Um because I don't I don't see them beating Nia clean. They never do. Well, you know, Becky's going to WrestleMania for the women's title. Well, she so should. It's about damn time somebody beats Nia clean. Well, I mean Rhea Ripley did too. Rhea Ripley did beat her clean, but that was the only one. Damage Control versus Zoe and Shayna, women's tag team titles. Uh, Damage Control won. Dakota interfered, and they hit the flying elbow on Shayna and Pinder. And nothing to write home about, but it was a it was a solid tag match. It was, Sorry. It was yeah. Fine, yeah. Andrade meets with Damage Control, and Rhea says, I asked him to stop by, guys. She says, you know, Dom's not here, but he speaks very highly of you, so maybe when he comes back we could get together and talk some business, if that's cool with you. And he says, yeah, it's cool, I... I'm all about the business. So he leaves, and then Finn says, I've known that guy for a long time, and he brings a lot to the table. So teasing that he'll be joining the Judgment Day. So then we had Priest versus Truth, and I haven't got an update, but they did a spot here where everyone's brawling on the outside, DIY runs out, they go after McDonough and Balor, and then Truth goes up top, and he does that big dive off the post, and it's the old seven ten split. He just goes right through the middle of four guys. And, man, this dude hit his head hard on the ground. And I don't know if anybody saw it because, like, the ref didn't check on him or anything. The ref's in the ring. And, like, he was just kind of there for a second. And then he managed to get up, got in the ring. Larry at South Haven for the pin. If I hear tomorrow he's in concussion protocol, it would not surprise me because that was scary. And then J.D. Finn and DIY got into a big brawl after the match. And they laid out Ciampa with the choke slam on the apron, and Balor hit the foot stamp, uh, foot stomp on Johnny. Laid him out. Jay came out, cut a promo on his brother, challenged him for mania. Brother versus brother, twin versus twin, blood versus blood. The crowd chanted "Yeet." He wants Jimmy was, to accept the challenge. It was funny. The first time he expected them to chant "Yeet," they didn't. So he had to like say the same line over again. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure in the script it said "Yeet." So they don't they don't say anything, right? So then he says the same line, like, and then they picked up on it. You well, know? he had I mean, to say it with the right cadence, like you give that pause where normally people well, he would did chant it, what he, he, he did it the first time. He did he did say it with the right cadence. They just didn't pick up on it. Yes. But the second time when he did it, it was like it was like the light bulb went off. And, oh, we're supposed to chant eat, and they did constantly. the The negative of this is that whenever you get people into doing this, they're probably going to start doing this for other people. Mm. And it's just going to be. You know, it can it can you know that that whole what thing ran its course twenty five hey, years give, ago. Hey, I'll give I'll give Drew credit because he's doing his promo. And they started chanting what, and he stops and he goes, "If you're happy, I beat CM Punk's ass. Say what?" And half the idiots said what again, and then they were like, "Ah!" And they started booing, and then they didn't do it again. So he shut him down. Yeah, Logan Paul shut him down too, or tried. Yeah. 
The key is to not stop talking. You've just got to kind of barrel on through so there's no pause for them to give their what chant or whatever. And we had the uh, the gauntlet. First Gunther did a promo and wished the luck to whoever won tonight. So they got 42 minutes for this gauntlet, and it starts with Ricochet and JD, and they went 11 minutes of this 42. And they had a good match. They had a good match. I knew we'd have some short matches coming up, but the story was Ricochet in the match injured his ribs, and he went for the shooting star, and JD got the knees up and hurt his ribs again, and finally Ricochet shoved him off, hit the shooting star, got the pin. So he's going into match two with bad ribs. And who should his opponent be but a giant heavy man, Bronson Reed. And so Bronson goes right to work on the ribs. Ricochet makes a big comeback. But then he gets slammed, running senton, tsunami, and he's pinned. Three minutes. Two, one minute, 51 seconds. But it was a good story. Then we had Bronson and Sami Zayn. And uh, they noted that it was the first day of Ramadan. And so Sammy had not eaten or drank anything all day and was coming in for this gauntlet. And so uh, they fought up top. That's such a good way to be dehydrated. And this was just like, I think they said that, that he had just started drinking again because uh, it was nightfall. Late in the day, yeah. But uh, so Sammy, this was exactly like those old Survivor Series matches in like the 80s where, uh, you know, they got eliminated a bunch of dudes, so people get pinned with, like, moves they would never get pinned by. So he'd say, sunset flip power bomb off the top and pin Bronson Reed. And that was about five minutes. Five minutes, six minutes. Six and a half minutes. So we had Sami Zayn, Shinsuke Nakamura. And I think they got about eight minutes, but four of it was during the break, so we only saw about four minutes of it. Six and, six and a half. But um, 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 uh, Bronson Reed laid out Sami Zayn after. So basically... Yes. The idea was that they were handing the win to Nakamura, but he still didn't win. He Sammy. went for the Kinshasa, got rolled up, and then they had a match. And Sammy avoided the uh, a, a dive off the middle rope, hit a running kick in the corner, and got the pin. And so that brought us to the last match, which was Sami Zayn and Chad Gable. And Chad gets in the ring, and Sammy's down, and he's hurting. But Chad does the heroic... We're not starting this match until you can get to your feet. Let's do this. And so Sammy gets to his feet. They ring the bell, and they had a very good match. I they had a great match. I thought it was really, really well done. Chad, Chad Gable was great. Sammy Zayn was great. Chad yeah. keeps going for the ankle lock, and Sammy's selling his ankle great. And uh, he gets put in the ankle lock over and over and over. He keeps getting out. And finally, he hits a hobbling boot in the corner, Crawls for the cover. Chad hits a crucifix very close near fall. Crowd super into the match at this point. And Chad's mouth is all bloody, and he pulls down the straps. He's going to go for the ankle lock again. But uh, he puts it on. Sammy reverses into a cradle. And this was an accident, but, like, shit happens. He cradles Gable. And Gable is cradled so high on his head and neck that literally neither of his shoulders are on the mat. Only his head and neck are on the mat, and uh, they're out of time. So the ref counts the pin anyway, and uh, it was exactly what you'd expect. Sammy wins, going to face Gunther, and uh, probably winning the title. And then Chad helped him to his feet and hugged him afterwards, and Gunther came out and stared down Sammy as the show ended. And uh, very good main event. Very good main event gauntlet match. And that was Raw. And as noted, we had the Raw lineup for uh, next week. And we've also got uh, a couple of things for SmackDown on Friday. Obviously, The Rock is going to be there. And we've also got Bailey and Dakota Kai in a singles match. And uh, Rey Mysterio is back. So that is the lineup for the show. And uh, that's going to do it for today. We've got uh, a bunch of shows up on the front page. Dave and uh, Garrett were up over the weekend doing UFC and everything else. And uh, we back on Wednesday, AW and NXT, the big business show, the uh, parent debut of Mercedes Monet. So uh, new Observer's out, new back issue. Check it out, everybody, and that's it. We'll talk to you again after a while.